here we go. I'm going to keep pulling up for about 25 inches, using more of my peripheral vision now, and we come to 100 feet. And about 150 feet, so now I'm going to transition my eyes out front, ease forward with that cycling nice and slowly, and we're good. That's a max performance takeoff. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to another flight training video with Alex John from Anthelion Helicopters. Uh, this will be the last one in the series for traffic patterns, so we're going to finish off today with max performance takeoffs and crosswind approaches and landings and takeoffs at the same time. Um, you know, they kind of all fit neatly together, ironically, at this at this juncture. So the, the max performance takeoff is, is kind of what you use with a steep approach when you're trying to get in and out of uh, confined areas. The main purpose of the max performance takeoff um, is uh, obstacle avoidance and sometimes turbulence avoidance as well, depending on if you're on top of a building or something like that at the same time. But but the most majority of your, your careers will be uh, obstacle avoidance. And it's, essentially it is... You know, just as we do in, uh, in in EMS or HAA, go go straight up until you've uh, uh, cleared an obstacle with a maximum amount of uh, uh, manifold pressure uh, that you're allowed to uh, to clear the obstacle as quickly as you can do because you're obviously in the uh, undesirable area of the HV diagram. And, uh, and then once you've got cleared the obstacle, then uh, then then proceed forward and get get through ETL and uh, and get out of there. Uh, and crosswind takeoffs and landings. Um, are essentially what they say, you know, we can't always guarantee that the wind is coming straight down the pipe towards us uh, when you're taking off and landing. So sometimes if you've got a pretty strong crosswind, it necessitates uh, almost like a crabbing maneuver uh, because it just can be very difficult to maintain directional stability on takeoff and landing when you've got a really strong crosswind. So we have to but mitigate that effect as safely as possible with a crosswind takeoff and landing. And we'll go through that as well. Bit of a mouthful, bit of a lot. Um, but it all makes sense when we get up there, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's get this show on the road. Well, we're good evening, helicopter 744 Hotel Sierra's Atlantic, requesting to join the path for Pad 3 with Lima. Guys, we are back on the ground here at our, uh, even seems to be very routine pad three here, uh, quite regularly now. Um, we're going to start talking through max performance takeoff. So, like we talked about, you know, we're uh, imagining that we're clearing a 150 foot obstacle, you know, usually if we're in a confined area, whether it's wires, trees, rocks, whatever it may be, um, we have to clear it safely, then we've pretty much got to go straight up for, uh, for as much as we can until we can uh, safely uh, be in a position to gain forward airspeed and uh, go through ETL and climb out successfully. So for right now, as far as I'm concerned, the, the front of the pad here is my tree or my cliff and it's 150 foot tall, so I have to clear that. Uh, first things are first, you know, we always want to check just how much power we can pull. Uh, right now we're in a Raven 1 here, so I'm looking at the temperature right now, it's about 20 odd. Um, and so I, in a Raven 1, which is slightly different to a, a Raven 2, uh, I can pull about 20, you know, my glasses. Uh, oh, the wrong, uh, uh, so it says 24.1, but then I'm going to add 1.6 to 25.7 inches of manifold pressure at this temperature. I may not need that, but it's just a good guide so that you don't get any drooping of your RPM if you try and just over pull, uh, which is which is no good, of course. Um, some people want to do a mag check uh, before uh, just to check the mags are working properly. You know, no hard and fast rule with that. You can if you want. Uh, I just checked them about two minutes ago, so I don't really need to do that. But again, you can if you want. Some people do it from a hover. Some people do it from the ground. You can do both. Again, you know, it's, uh, usually what will happen is you bring it up into a hover to start with, stabilize, and then just keep going up with that. We'll try and do it in one swift motion. In the real world, if you can have enough forward space, try and get through ETL as you're climbing as, as vertically as you can. It'll just help. It'll give you that little bit more extra efficiency in the rotor system. And, any, and especially if you're at a high DA, uh, you'll get that, you know, be that easier to, to, to get out high density altitude. So you could, you know, either high elevation or it's hot or a combination of the above, uh, high humidity, all those things add to DA. 
you know, again, if, if you are trying to get out in a, in a, uh, a rather confined area and you're trying to, you know, uh, give yourself as much opportunity to get through retail as possible, you might find yourself having to back up to the, the rearmost portion of your landing area. You know, always fly with your tail for that. Don't just back up. Uh, you know, obviously you'd have to turn around at that point and uh, only do so if you can do it safely. So, uh, you know, there's far more little eccentricities to this, but we're just going to assume right now we're in the position to do the takeoff and we're going to do it from here. Uh, and just go straight up. We're assuming I'm as far back as I can go in my spot. I'm as far away from my obstacle as I can possibly make it. We'll just make the best of it of what we can. So the aim of the game here is we're going to literally, again, pick it up into a hover. I'm going to use my peripheral, peripheral vision a lot with this. So I'm not just looking forward. I'm actually using my peripheral vision to look outside to the side as well to make sure I don't drift left or right or move backwards and forwards at the same time. I need that sort of 300, you know, sort of 270 degree arc as it were, a vision to make sure I stay reasonably uh, still over my spot which I took off from so I don't drift anywhere into any potential obstacles. So it really is you know, a, a true peripheral vision uh, kind of exercise here. And I'll explain more of that when actually we're doing it at the same time. And you know, once you come up to your power setting you know, that you want to use, just hold that power setting. Don't start looking back down into the, into the cockpit and fiddling with your power setting again. Once you've got a good rate of climb, uh, sufficient rate of climb, just, just stick with that. Don't overcomplicate things. More important that you concentrate on staying in the same position and maintaining that uh, same point, uh, as, as it were, as you climb out. And then once you've hit your tar uh, target altitude, then it's nosing it forward. Make sure you nose it forward, but don't lose altitude because you might just go and nose down into the trees, which is no good. So, you know, you might have to leave yourself a little bit of power reserve. Or just be very gentle with it to, to not lose altitude when you try and push forward because you will be sacrificing potentially a little bit of altitude for airspeed. So be cognizant of that. Don't do it too abruptly, otherwise you could end up going into the obstacles that you were trying to avoid in the first place. All right. With that being said, let me call the tower and let's give this a go. So here we go. We're going to ease up on the collective like we're coming into a hover. Light on the skids, peripheral vision, eyes outside. There we go up. Now I'm going to keep pulling up. Put about 25 inches. Using more of my peripheral vision now. And I'm coming up to about 100 feet. Uh, about 150 feet, so now I'm going to transition my eyes out front, ease forward with that cycling nice and slowly. Inside my individual for hotels, yeah. And ease forward through ETL, and we're going to start to climb out. Keep control of your pedals, keep control of all your track, and we're good. That's a max performance takeoff. So it's pretty self-explanatory. The trick is with the max performance takeoff, really just maintaining that position. So that we don't drift. All right, so let's talk a bit more once we get around here and I just clear ourselves on the downwind about a crosswind approach. All right, guys, I'm going to set up for a crosswind approach now. So. Again, you know, you're going to have to kind of judge uh, if you need to do a crosswind approach. It, it, the whole purpose is you being able to maintain sufficient control of the aircraft on the approach to make it as safe as possible. Um, you know, usually that's going to be more of an issue uh, if you've got a direct east or uh, a Long Beach here, a direct north or south wind. South wind is pretty common, north not very at all. So right now we're going fast enough where it's not too much of an issue, you know, free landing checks, one lights out, gauges in degree, pressure temperatures up, copy out of the yellow arc on the 44 here. I'm looking at the windsock right now, we've got a pretty good south wind right now, um, so what we're going to do is as we get a little bit closer here and essentially I'm going to split the difference between the direction I want to go in and the direction of the wind, so if it's coming from if it's coming from south, I'm going to split about 45 degrees right here. Still using the cyclic to control my ground track, so I'm going in the right direction. But I'm mitigating the effect of this wind effect on the aircraft so it doesn't jerk around all over the place. As I'm coming in slower here, now this is a school of thought where it depends what you want to do. You have two choices. You can either straighten the nose out right before you come in through ETL and just deal with that crosswind because you want those skids absolutely straight so if there's any issues you have a minimal chance of rollover or the other school of thought which is a, again a personal preference is if the crosswind is so strong 
uh, moving that nose into the into a straight position compromises the safety and potentially integrity of your approach. Then keep it offset. You know, there's no sometimes no perfect solutions to this stuff. Um, and so if you're if you're in, in ever in any doubt that you cannot maintain directional stability of the aircraft as you come through ETO when your nose is straight, then don't put it straight. You know. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a risk for, for sure if obviously anything goes wrong and then you, you might risk rolling but that's far less likely potentially than you losing control if you cannot maintain directional authority uh, if, you're, if you've got a really really strong crosswind so you know the lesser of two evils in that respect and you, you point the nose like this and just keep it absolutely level uh, until these touch down so if I just back up here just a little bit you'll kind of see what I mean Roger thanks see you in a bit so essentially what I'd be talking about is that, you know, even coming on that final, your instinct wants to put the skid straight, but the wind is so strong that you would keep it at a 45 degree angle, literally all the way in to the pad. Then once you've got it under control in a 3 to 5 foot hover, then you would bring it back straight. So kind of two ways of doing it, depending on the prevailing conditions and your comfort level. They both have applicability, they both have their pros and cons, and it's really going to be up to you to decide which way you want to go with it. And the same thing is true, let's do a crosswind takeoff. You know, again, if we've got a really strong crosswind right now and you're worried about directional stability, you know, we can split the difference. And as we get through ETL and get some directional stability, then we can put the nose uh, level uh, in terms of the, the ground track that you want to, want to attain. You know, and so it's all going to be just using your peripheral vision um, in conjunction with your control of the pedals, the cyclic, and the collective as a normal takeoff. We just have the nose pointing in a slightly different area. So we'll just do it right now. One lights our pressure temperature in the green. Car Pete is out of the yellow. Let me turn the radios back up. No delay on your departure. Western 30, no delay for hotels here. All right, here we go then. So normal takeoff, split the difference with the nose, directional control, look at the direction I want to go in, waiting for ETL, there's ETL, right pedal, coming forward with the nose, continuing on my de normal departure profile, and off we go. And that is literally it for a crosswind takeoff. Just hold that odd little uh, heading with the nose until you are through ETL, put the nose straight, continue to climb like a normal Take off. All right, guys. So that was uh, max performance takeoff today with uh, crosswind approach and crosswind takeoff. Again, max performance takeoff. Uh, it's all about getting out of confined spaces uh, with obstacle clearance and avoidance. Uh, usually, what we do again: check your manifold pressure, make sure you've got a vertical ascent either from a hover or from the ground, entirely up to you, uh, which one you want to do. And once you have reached your obstacle clearance height, uh, then just ensure that you don't push the nose forward too quickly and uh, dip straight into the obstacle you were trying to clear and always, always, always maintain directional uh, authority with your pedals at the same time. Crosswind takeoff uh, and crosswind approach, basically both for the same reason. If you've got an absolutely stinking crosswind that... Uh, uh, stops you having the uh, authority that you want to over the control of the aircraft and jeopardizes uh, a safe landing or a safe takeoff. Uh, so split the difference uh, as much as you can uh, with the nose on uh, on approach. You can either choose, uh, once you come through ETL, depending on how strong that wind is, either to keep that nose absolutely uh, into the wind or at the very least split into the wind to maintain that authority. If you feel that you don't need to do that, then uh, when you get close to the ground, you can uh, put that nose back straight to mitigate the effect of any uh, issues of rollover should anything happen in those final few feet. But judge that for yourself and always keep in mind the circumstances and the prevailing circumstances in your, your ability levels and the safety of the overall aircraft. Uh, in the takeoff, um, you know, it's, it's a normal takeoff with the, noise po the nose pointing in uh, a different direction. Uh, so again, split that difference of the wind. Once you have got the nose through ETL, uh, then put it back straight and, and continue on your climb out. I hope you guys got something out of it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll look forward to getting into probably radio communications next time, which is the bugbear of uh, many uh, aspiring pilot. So uh, well, I'll try to give some good hints and tips and uh, procedures for the best ways to get through that uh, to make you guys more uh, comfortable and competent on the radios. And that's VFR, not IFR. Everyone flies safe and uh, has a great time out there. And uh, like all these things, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.